I told you there'd be more vampires in this countdown. Here's a criminally underseen vamp flick coming in at number seven. This is M.L. Miller Frights, Best in Horror Countdown, 2022 through 2023. Counting down the best in horror within the window of October 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2023. Number 7. The Last Voyage of the Demeter was released on August 11th, 2023. It's available on demand from Universal Pictures. It's directed by Andre Orvidal and written by Bragi F. Schutt, Stefan Ruzawitsky, Zach Olkiewicz, and based on the chapter Captain's Log from Bram Stoker's Dracula. The Demeter is a cargo ship from Romania filled with 50 strange crates heading on a trip across arduous waters destined for England. Misplaced scholar Clemens, played by Black Klansman's Corey Hawkins, makes his way on board with a crew of scurvy gents, including character actors Game of Thrones' Liam Cunningham as the captain, David Dastmalchian as first mate Wojciech, and sailor Olgarin, played by Stefan Kapicic, who was the voice of Colossus in the Deadpool movies. When the Demeter sets off, a stowaway named Anna, played by the Nightingale's Aisling Franciosi, is found in the hall touting that an ancient evil is on board. Soon crew members begin toppling with a serious lack of blood every time night falls. Turns out THE Count Dracula, played by go-to tall monster actor Javier Botet, is on board and he's super hungry. The Last Voyage of the Demeter extends one of the coolest chapters in Bram Stoker's Dracula in a blockbuster way. This is epic storytelling. Sure, we know Dracula is going to make it through the voyage and eventually start sucking on Mina's neck bone, but there still is a lot of story to tell as we're introduced to an interesting cast full of talented actors worth investing in. Director Andre Orvidal delivers his biggest and best film since his first feature, Troll Hunter. While I loved The Autopsy of Jane Doe, it was a small-scale horror movie. And while it had its moments, I really felt scary stories to tell in the dark wasn't all that scary and much more kid-friendly than I'd hoped. Here, Orvidal is able to tell a much more sophisticated tale with adult characters going through absolutely harrowing horrors, dealing with themes that feel mature and thus more interesting than a bunch of kids running away from a monster on bikes. Each member of the crew seems to be having a crisis of faith, be it believing in God, science, the future, peace, or even themselves. This trip means opportunity for the crew, taking them away from the old world ways of Romania and closer to the more forward-thinking land of England. Well, as forward-thinking as you could be in 1897. As the Demeter sets sails, the crew sees nothing but a better life ahead and while it is tough enough on the high seas, add a vampire to the mix, and this trip becomes downright treacherous. The set design is fantastic, as we get to know every inch of the ship by midway through the film, making it part of the tension as characters venture into some of the dark places where we know evil is hiding. From the costumes to the props used, everything looks and feels absolutely authentic. Everything feels drenched in seawater and warped by time. You usually don't see this level of detail in craftsmanship in horror films, but this one looks and feels like you've been transported back to the dark and dirty times of 1897. The ship itself becomes an obstacle course for the sailors as they go below and above decks and even into the sails themselves to evade Dracula's fangs. You're not going to find a better cast of character actors than what you find in The Last Voyage of the Demeter. All of the main roles are played by actors you've seen many, many times before. Liam Cunningham is an icon and is fantastically gritty as the captain of the Demeter. He's given a very meaty role here with a lot of emotions to juggle. David Dasmalchian is equally gruff as the first mate and serves as a great foil to Corey Hawkins, who shines in the lead role of Clemens, whose name isn't on the manifest, so his fate remains an outlier to the main story. While many have joked about including a black person in a period piece, his race is at least addressed in the story and ends up giving him some strong motivation to be on the ship. Ainsling Franciosi 
does a lot with what could be a one-note role as one of Dracula's concubines who is struggling to maintain her own humanity. I also thought little Woody Norman, who we last saw starring in another awesome horror movie, Cobweb, does a heck of a job with a lot of emotional lifting for such a young star. All around, the actors work well together, and it really seems like they're giving it their all to make this film work. This helps because each of them have deep backstories and motivations that make you want to care for them, rather than just being fodder to be eventually drained by Drac. Javier Botet fleshes out the close-ups of Dracula, while the actor often seems to be working from the same bag of tricks in most of the roles he's given, this one is one of the first movies that I didn't instantly recognize his bizarre movements. There's a lot of CG done with Dracula, but all of these shots really feel incorporated into the live-action stuff. So much better than what we've all gotten used to with the rushed superhero CG heavy films of late. And this Drac, he's scary as hell, which is no easy feat. While there have been scores of Dracula and vampire films made, even though this one looks not too different from many of the other incarnations that we've seen, everything about this version still feels fresh and new. With everything going for this film, I really do wonder why it didn't do so well in theaters. Vampire films are usually pretty popular. Scary stories to tell in the dark seem to do decently. Some have theorized that the name wasn't grabbing enough. The Last Voyage of the Demeter is a mouthful and it also doesn't have any indication that there will be vampires in it. It also lacks a big-name actor attached to it, but horror movies rarely do these days. The fact that this was released at the end of the summer might be a factor, though it's hard for this cinephile to comprehend a lot of people want to go out rather than stay inside and watch a two-hour horror movie, especially when the days of summer are numbered. Still, it's a mystery, and I'm sure those behind the film are trying to understand it all as well. I hope that even though The Last Voyage of the Demeter didn't do well in the theaters, it'll find an audience and surface as a cult hit, as the film really does deserve to be seen and enjoyed by many. The Last Voyage of the Demeter indeed is an epic in size, scope, and subject matter. It seemed to have spared no expense with the amazing sets, and the entire cast does their absolute best. Seek this one out. In theaters if you can. But no matter where you see it, you're in for one of the best Dracula films you're going to see in ages. Blood is definitely not your typically romanticized version of the vampire. Still, it's an effective little vampire tale in need of recognition. Blood was released on January 27th, 2023. It's streaming on Hulu from Vertical Entertainment. It's directed by Brad Anderson and written by Will Honley. Single mother Jess, played by Michelle Monaghan, is struggling to keep up with her demanding job as a nurse, her former addiction to pills, and raising a pair of kids, Tyler, played by Skylar Morgan-Jones, and Owen, played by Finlay Wajak Hisong. Jess is attempting to build a stable life for her kids and moves into a house in the country. But when the kid's dog takes an interest in a spooky old tree in the middle of a marsh, the dog disappears and returns later very different. When the dog bites Owen, it sends the young boy into the hospital where he develops a hunger that only blood can satiate. Now, Jess has to battle her own morality in order to get fresh human blood for Owen to keep him alive. Brad Anderson, who delivered the absolutely excellent Session 9, The Machinist, and much of the Fringe series, returns to horror with this vampire film and manages to never mention the word vampire once. Instead, blood is grounded in reality focusing on Owen's addiction to blood and Jess's dedication to sacrificing everything in order to fill this hunger. This film is a metaphor for the lengths a mother will go to protect and make sure her child is okay. The main problem is that Owen is everything but okay. He goes into convulsions if he eats regular food, and the longer he is without fresh blood, the closer he is to turning into a feral animal. The film puts Jess into a moral conundrum with no chance for a happy ending. Anderson and his writer Will Honey heap on problem after problem on the back of Monaghan's Jess, and there's no good end coming here. Monaghan is wonderful as Jess, an emotionally complex character faced with a decision to uphold the Hippocratic Oath as a nurse or break it in order to save someone she loves. With pressure from her ex-husband, played by a very restrained Skeet Ulrich, 
to be the perfect mother in a past filled with opiate addiction, just as a powder keg, just clinging to some semblance of stability even before her son is bitten. Once she understands what she needs to do in order to save her child, Jess is forced to go against everything she believes and ignores everything else, causing all of her spinning plates to wobble and drop. It's heartbreaking to see Jess twist and turn in order to try to make things right and fail so horribly with every step. Though the vampire story is overplayed, Anderson makes the story riveting the whole way through because of the real-life issues Jess and her family face. Seeing them try to adjust to this insane condition really works, and I found myself feeling every painful misstep Jess makes. The effects are pretty subtle. The glowing red eyes effect really communicates the inhuman nature of both the dog and Owen. Later, some more extreme makeup is used as Owen continues to lose his humanity, but for the most part, there's just a lot of blood splattered all over the place, a must for every modern vampire film. I was surprised how affected I was by this arduous drama with subtle supernatural elements. Anderson delivers an emotionally charged and viscerally impactful tale of motherhood. Anderson pulls no punches in running this entire family through the ringer, and while it hurts to watch it, I have to admire the way this predicament played out and the depths this film went by the end. Blood is not feel-good horror, but it is strongly acted and provides a conundrum that is as potent for tragedy as you can get. As always, feel free to agree, disagree, or how about you play along at home and give me your own picks for your favorite horror movies. It's October, so let's talk horror. Come back tomorrow for the next level in the Best in Horror countdown. Be sure to hit all of those pertinent bells and whistles down below, and you'll never miss a post. Happy Halloween, folks.